Hello, everybody. This is James Chai, our Farf Park Park Rescue Foundation, registered nonprofit. Today is November 20th, 2019, and this is vlog episode 39. And I am getting closer and closer to finally figuring out how to use equipment. I had to return some stuff and order some new stuff. And uh, anyone who's ever done a vlog or a podcast or anything like this, my gosh, wow, it's like so complicated. I, I, I'm the, the, the technology is way beyond anything that I can even understand now. I, don't, I cannot believe how old I am now. In, in the old days when I was young, I, I had no, re, no, no issue at all looking things up and understanding what it all means. And now I'm just like, huh, what? Can I find a young person to help? Hey, thanks. My, uh, oh, yeah. Thanks, Kim. I hope Blossom and River are doing good with Luke and all that. Uh, all right. So I'm just going to – I'm going to try to see if I can um, – check out because I'm, I'm doing this off my cell phone i'm sorry I'm doing this off my computer and i don't know if the um oh, uh, oh, okay it. we're gonna turn I the sound down can, uh, just so i can see the comments going on because it's it's kind of hard to show and actually look at i i've got a screen i can see myself now and i can see comments so i, I think it's going to work out um but yeah i have a new uh i, I just i took the old video camera that i had uh, that i bought from amazon that was sent to me un, unpacked and wrapped in plastic, and this lens was open. So I went and picked up a, a new one. Um, I traded it in and decided to go and uh, you know exercise my credit card a little bit more and bought myself a Canon SL3, and that is a new uh, a new model from obviously from Canon, and it's great for uh, for doing live shots. And let me just say, I should have actually had this. I did, I wasn't even going to show this anyways. Whatever. And, uh, this is it. I know it doesn't look like much, right? But it does. I it does um, uh, 4K recording as well, and then it comes with a little bit of a lens and stuff like that. So once I do that, and then I've got my uh, my mics. I have a couple of. Uh, I'm going to be ordering some other stuff as well, just so I can uh, figure out what to do. So yeah. Anyways, uh, I should get to it. I, it is today is about resource guarding and dog on my bed that attacks me. And I just had a, 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 a um, Sean with her dog, Buddy. I worked with her uh, a number of months ago and all that stuff. And as things have shifted and changed at home, um, Buddy became uh, a bit more anxious at being left behind because mom was starting to work shift work, not well split shift work, I guess. And so that caused uh, a bit of a change what was going on. And then um, she was uh, taking buddy to a, uh, a doggy daycare that uh, she said she just needed them to take care of, uh, of, of her dog for one, one day, one night. And um, it was like a Saturday. And then she, you know, Sunday she wants to go and pick up uh, her dog uh, buddy and they actually tell her that they can't release her dog to her on a Sunday. Literally, she had, a, had an actual argument with not just the staff, then on Monday, she had an argument with the, um, uh, with the what you call it, uh, with the manager as well. And, and basically, she, Sean is like, how is it not possible for me to be able to get my own dog back on a Sunday? instead of having to wait to Monday and paying for it as well. And I guess the explanation from the doggy daycare was our staff are not trained on how to release a dog. That's right. They don't know how to take uh, uh, buddies, toys and, and food and dishes and put it into a bag and then find buddy out of five or six dogs and give buddy and his bag back to his mom on a Sunday. Apparently, nobody knows how to do that. They're at this doggy daycare. And it's actually a well-known doggy daycare. I'm really surprised. I was really, really surprised when she told me that because uh, I, I kind of thought, how's that? How, how, like, what is wrong with people? Like, like why would you? Uh, anyways. Oh, uh, Stephanie, uh, Stephanie Campbell is, uh, is watching here. And she has set up her own 501c charity. And that is, the, you know, in the United States, it's a charity. So she can issue tax uh, she can issue tax uh, receipts and all that stuff in the United States. And her, her rescue is called the Big Mutts, M-U-T-T-S. And the Big Mutts, as in the Big Butts. And um, uh, so she is uh, going to be working on developing her rescue organization. And it's pretty cool considering that what Stephanie's done is she set up 
her rescue by registering it as a charity. In the United States, to, to be registered as a charity is, is way easier from what Stephanie was telling me and, and a couple other people who've set up charities in the U.S., uh, way easier to set up a dog rescue charity than it is here in Canada. In Canada, we can do nonprofit status, which is what I am. But to apply for charitable status, such as the Red Cross or the SPCA, it's pretty well next to impossible. It's doable, but it's pretty well next to impossible. And it kind of sucks because it, it doesn't allow more of the NGOs to have an opportunity to assist in, in an environment. I had a conversation with a friend of mine uh, about a week and a half ago regards to all the dogs that are in shelters millions are in shelters every year and um, she asked well why aren't the rescues stepping up and, and taking care of these dogs that are going to be killed and all that and it's like you know these rescues uh, all these rescues like myself and all that and I'm very specific with my rescue work but the other rescues are taken all breeds or, or you know larger number of dogs um, we're all strapped for cash we don't have money coming out of our uh, out of our ears. We're only, we barely we're lucky we have money in our bank account sometimes to see what we can uh, cover for costs and everything. And um, so she she was under the impression that rescue orgs, nonprofits, and charities were able to and just basically not willing to do these things, um, just because of the way the politicians have set things up. It's kind of a it's kind of a drag because um, there are literally six million dogs being killed annually in North America. So when that happens, um, you know, only the dogs uh, only the dogs suffer, and that's the worst part about it. Uh, all right, so I, I'm going to get to it. Uh, I found it very difficult to meet some dogs and some of the rescues. Yeah, um, Kim says I find it I uh, found it very difficult to meet some of the dogs and rescue, and she's right because a lot of times. Uh, rescues have to have really specific um, you know, criteria, and the only way we learn is by our mistakes. Obviously, we'll we'll talk to other rescue orgs and people who are uh, much more experienced and say, "Hey, what should we do?" But there's always inevitably going to be a mistake, and that mistake ends up happening. Where uh, you know, I had a I had a dog, a, a Great Dane, um, that was uh, adopted out. And then um, the family wasn't able to to keep him because of his size and and issues. So basically, they they brought him back and they returned him. And it's tough because every time you know, and I don't do a lot of dog adoptions, but when they go out, I'm I'm worried. I'm I'm nervous. I'm I hope that he does okay or she does okay in the new home, and I hope they love him. Uh, and they'll take care of them. And then when they come back, it's really kind of disheartening on, on my end or anybody who runs rescue. It's disheartening on our end because we feel sad that our dog who has what we think or consider as a temporary home with us is not able to find a home. And it's a bit of a struggle. Actually, I have to put Anthony up for uh, adoption. Yeah, uh, he's uh, he's pretty pretty funny. I was just talking to my roommate down uh, who lives in the in the basement suite, and I was just telling him how Anthony's such a jerk. Anthony love he's 160 plus pounds. He's uh, almost 20 months of age. So if anyone's looking for a beautiful guy, uh, he's available for for adoption. Super loving. If he lays beside you on the couch, if he lays beside me on the couch, within minutes he will have crept up and laid right on top of me. And if there's another dog already on top of me, like another, uh, like, you know, Lincoln or Walter Nero, whatever is on top of me, Anthony will literally scoot in and scoot in and scoot in and push him off with his size. And even if they're bigger than him, he doesn't care. He's just like, yeah, I just got to get close to my human. He's super affectionate, uh, really hard uh, pull on the leash. So working on that every once in a while, but it's hard in this neighborhood because I don't have a sidewalk to work on and to train him. So, uh, but yeah, rescue is really tough. Um, you know, uh, people like Stephanie, uh, and Amy Rainoshek from, uh, Save Rocky Great Dane Rescue and Rehab Charity. That's the largest Great Dane Rescue in North America. Um, uh, all these people who run these rescues, uh, we do so out of social, uh, beliefs that we should do a bit more. And I know it's really tough sometimes to, um, to, you know, if you're looking for a dog to adopt, it's really tough sometimes because you feel that you're getting rejected. Uh, but unfortunately, the rescue themselves have to look out for the better uh, uh, future of their dog, dogs, and, and decide what to do then. Actually, that brings me up to something that kind of made me super sad this uh, last couple of days and uh, made me really upset. And, and my friend Debbie, 
uh, and, and her husband, Ma, uh, Mike, um, they know I don't swear. Like I, I've stopped. I don't, I try not to swear anymore because it's being profane is just not really, uh, uh, but I was swearing uh, the other day a lot because uh, a rescue that had a dog, a young dog, uh, under two years of age. And, um, uh, the rescue didn't recognize that this dog was getting too much uh, overstimulated in the wrong uh, foster home. And there was other foster dogs and other existing dogs. And um, so this, this foster dog of this rescue ended up, ended up attacking another one of uh, the foster's smaller dogs. And uh, it was a, it was a bad attack. I mean, it usually is. I mean, dogs are predaceous or predators. And so what ended up happening is the rescue, instead of having pulled this dog out or having dealt with the issue or contacted me and they know me, um, killed the dog the same day, uh, literally a couple hours later, they killed the dog. And, and what's even worse is they took the dog, they took the, the, this, this innocent dog, all they, if they, if they're having troubles, they could have just contacted me and asked me for help. And I've already worked with another dog, a, a number of their dogs. They could have just sent the dog back uh, or whatever. And, and this is, you know, this is actually just not just a one occasion. This has happened numerous times with different rescues. And so, so instead of addressing it or, you know, hindsight and all that stuff, uh, they killed, uh, they killed this dog. And that was already bad enough. And, um, you know, for me, it's, it's really quite hurtful. What's even worse is the fact that, they took this dog to this horrible vet. I know this vet and he's horrible. And, and my, my best friend uh, had gone to this same vet on the same recommendation of this rescue because he was looking at adopting a rescue uh, from them and told me the exactly the same feelings that I had. And he asked me what I thought first. And I'm like, well, I hate them. And he goes, oh, good. And he tells me, and I talked to other people and they all say the same thing. And so what ended up happening is this innocent, dog right i mean yes he he attacked another dog but he's a victimized in that situation and he's young and he could have been saved and um so they took him to this horrible vet this this vet so such a cheap scamming vet i mean i i'd say that because he quoted me one because i he was recommended to me by the rescue and he he quoted me uh, uh, one price uh, for some stitches, which is about $250. And I explained to them who the dog is, what the issues are. I said, they're going to have to surgically uh, incise out, uh, excise out um, a, a large, like a one inch by maybe two inch section of it, because it'll probably have been become infected because of the fur, debrided and all that stuff and everything. And um, they didn't even, so they quoted me like $250. And then when I got there, then the a couple of days later for the scheduled appointment, it was a $700 plus quote. And I said, Hey, I told you guys. And he goes, Oh, he's a bigger dog. And I said, yeah, I told you, I told you exactly who the dog was. You've seen him before. And he said, Oh, you know, it's more of this and that, that, you know, it's like, Holy crap. And then they couldn't even properly sedate him under anesthesia as well. He was still awake. He was still blinking under anesthesia when they told me to leave. And then when I got back to pick him up, pick him up and he, you know, Danes are huge. And um, they had him in a, kennel that he could literally not even turn his body shoulder to shoulder in it it's i said why don't you put him in one of your waiting room offices that you're not using that's got supplies in it and they refused to do so and then when i showed up i was like holy crud so anyhow uh, this rescue took that dog uh, this victimized innocent dog beautiful black dog took him to the vet and uh, from what I heard is that um, the, the one of the fosters went there. The other one couldn't. It was just too tragic. And uh, so this vet sedated, right? So it's, it's supposed to be a two-stage. Uh, you, you sedate the dog until he's unconscious or she's unconscious. And then you administer the, the, the drug that kills them. Uh, you know, it should be always a two-step not one step where they have both solutions together. Cause then that means the dog is still conscious. And so they sedated him and they came back a few minutes later. They should have waited 10 minutes, but they came back a few minutes later and he was still alert. And so what did the, what did this piece of garbage vet do? He still administered the drug to kill this dog while he was still alert. 
and apparently it took this dog uh, almost uh, almost one minute to die and they said um that he was gasping for breath trying to stay alive he was dying yeah, as his heart stops his lungs stop everything stops and he's effing dying gasping for breath in front of them and this vet is a piece of garbage because he could tell and see that the dog was alert and he should have administered a stronger sedative but because he's so freaking cheap that he didn't administer more sedative and the more additional sedative what 10 20 30 bucks this rescue brings this 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 vet tens of thousands of dollars of business and um I can, because I've met this dog several times. Uh, I never worked with him. I just met him at the foster, working with another dog of theirs. <laughs> this dog's like an innocent little puppy, like a boy, like, you know, the little eyes and the fear and the worry on him. And, um, you know, for a vet to do this, to be so cheap, to be so lazy, to be in such an effing rush, to not even try to further sedate a dog that was alert, and to see him gasping for breath for a mi- oh, almost one minute. And one minute is a really long time. If anybody's ever had to break up a dog fight, 20 seconds is an eternity. Because of the viciousness and, and the issues that are gone. It's, uh, I've had to break up a dog fight uh, between Danes and a, and a third dog. Um, and it took me about a minute and 20 seconds to break that fight up. And it, was, it just seemed like it lasted forever. So I can just imagine what it would have felt like uh, for this poor dog to to basically die and see the the person that he trusted, one of the people that he trusted, killing him. And uh, this vet just absolutely sucks. And the rescue continues going to him. I don't even understand this. Uh, it, it's extremely just disgusting and sad is, is all I can say. Um, so uh, every, every time I work with a dog, every time it's always an extreme situation, every dog, right? I mean, I I don't do the basic training stuff. I don't do the little, little, you know, um, uh, issues and all stuff I can, and it's not a problem for me, obviously, because if I'm working at this scale, if I'm working at this top of the scale with predatorial dogs that trap and stalk and and try to kill people, Dogs that are, you know, minor OCD issues are, are just very quick, you know, without having to use medication or anything like that. And they're really quick to do so. And, uh, you know, it really hurts. It really hurts to see this happening. And, you know, the truth is, yeah, he, you know, this dog is one of probably 100 dogs that will have died that day in, in, in Vancouver, right? There's almost almost 200,000 dogs. Uh, I think I, I, uh, I looked at stats and also I think there's like 187,000 dogs in this city, uh, almost 200,000 actually. Um, so there's, you know, 100 dogs, 200 dogs being killed today, tomorrow. It'll just keep happening, right? And you look at 200 dogs out of 200,000 dogs, that's, that's 0.1%. And uh, so it was really just really just heartening to see what happened to this poor dog and to see how um, he was betrayed. Uh, just the, the vet of all people should have put compassion ahead of greed. So rest in peace, puppy boy, wherever you are, rest in peace. You know, it's too bad. Um, okay, so I want to get back to uh, with the topic here. Sorry, I just kind of went down and then back up a bit. Just it's just really hard. It just I didn't I didn't go to bed last night till eight, or I didn't go to bed till this morning till eight a.m. because uh, it happened. Uh, yeah, so it was really um, really hurtful and it, it really it really hits me really hard. So when people ask uh, about their dog and and dealing with issues, I'm always hundred percent interested in helping. Um, you know, and I always read this stuff where people say, well, these trainers, ex-trainers, I spent, you know, $4,000, I spent 7000 I spent, I know one, uh, one couple that spent over ten grand, And um, <clears throat> all getting wrong information. And, you know, like I said, you, you, you get in wrong information, you're just going to keep going down the wrong path and it just doesn't stop. Um, actually, <clears throat> I had some fool on my, uh, on my YouTube channel 
Uh, what's this guy's name is he goes by ill i l l ill clinton as in uh donald oh no sorry bill clinton i'm thinking donald clinton and um he he's i i think he he says he teaches an undergrad class and stuff like that and he talks about how bf skinner is correct and and how uh you know <laughs> just uh, there's so, so much ineptitude when it comes to um uh when it comes to 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 the dog training industry to the uh um to the um academia it's it's incredible ineptitude and then when they're confronted with proof from the work that i do they can only not answer anything they avoid answering or else they say nothing uh, like they say a couple of lines and they talk about something totally unrelated to to my argument so it's the simple thing i said to this guy ill clinton and obviously it's not his real name i said hey i said to him uh show me any refutation any proof anything to disprove that nowhere in the entire canine species does food exist as a reward fiat communication tool. He avoided answering it. And he just tried to call him after me. And I'm like, well, and he's talking about how great BF Skinner is with operant conditioning and the four quadrants and all this stuff. And I went back and said to him, you know what? The BF Skinner guy, I mean, I read his, uh, his uh, Beyond Dignity, uh, got to like page 26, 27. And it's like, it's like reading a kid's uh, crayon book just talking circles and just reinforcing the same thing over and over again, which is what he's talking about. But you know, I, my last blog, I, I, I debunked it. I showed uh, links of uh, it's being debunked. Um, it, it just, it just, it's unbelievable. We, we have these people who are somewhat at the top academic levels and, and, and reputational levels and they don't care. They don't care to learn that they're wrong. Obviously, that's kind of an oxymoronic statement, but truly, uh, they don't they don't want to learn that they're wrong. They don't care. They would rather follow the same path where they have a sixty percent success rate, and then and then rest on that. And I've always said to everybody, anybody and everybody, any trainer, behaviors, if you don't believe what I do, bring a dog to me. Doesn't matter how dangerous a dog is. Doesn't matter what size a dog is. Bring the dog to me. I'll prove it to you. And then at the same turn, then you take one of my dogs and you work with one of my dogs under the same simplicity of no treats, no medication, no oppressive or suppressive or painful uh, uh, corrective devices. Do what I do. Everyone chickens out. Everyone uh, uh, redirects and says, oh, no, and they go off and talk about something else and they, they create an argument and different, they, they, they misdirect. But here, you know, anybody who's, who's worked with me, you know, I mean, y'all who are watching, y'all know that. Don't believe that I can do with every single dog, pro, uh, progress them 100% with that consistency. Bring the dog to me. Prove it. Two things are going to happen. Either one, I'm going to get attacked viciously and, and likely critically injured. Or two, I'm going to prove it that's why i have the trainers and behaviors in the city some are following me uh, and others who are following me then backstab me while asking me for advice and then i have the other ones who just don't care and these are the ones that near the top of the food chain here in vancouver i got guy uh, i got uh, people like dr rebecca ledger writing uh, tacit uh, vancouver column uh, vancouver sun column articles uh, about me tacitly uh, uh, I mean, the difference is if you, if these people really cared about dogs, they would ask, Hey, you know what, James, this stuff you're doing is absolutely crazy and bizarre. And I've never seen it before. And I don't know why or how it works, but my true love is to help save the dog. So can I come and see what you're doing? Can you come and show me what you're doing with one of my dogs, my cl client's dogs? Nobody cares. I get people who've gone to multiple trainers that come to me and then I have to correct all the issues that these other trainers have done because the dog learns to adapt. The dog learns to adapt to the new techniques and new tricks. And then they start 
figuring out, well, I don't have to comply. And then people go, whoa, the, he was good for a few months and now he's worse. The dog's not worse. It's just because your dog has learned how to outsmart you. And it's not done on purpose. The dog is, a, is predacious. The dog is going to look at the opportunities that are presented like a good salesperson. They're going to look for the nuances in what your behavior is. They're going to see how you're moving around physically and your, your gait. I tell people to use their voice. Don't, don't bend over. Don't squat over. Don't do these things that compromise the integrity of your body mechanics. You always want to be vigilant with your dog. You always want to pay attention to your dysfunctional dog. If it's a regular dog that doesn't have any issues and happy-go-lucky, right? This is not for you. But if it's a dog that has dysfunctions, you got to be vigilant. You got to watch them constantly, even months later. Uh, you know, with Nero, he, he was pretty good. I mean, you know, he grabbed me one time, like I said, by the top of the head. And he, he, he actually got, got me by the uh, top of the head in one mouth thing. And, um, and he nipped both sides of my temples, uh, drawing a little bit of blood. Uh, cause I purposely, uh, did so do that. Uh, I've had Walter where he's, you know, when he got away, escaped from his police, uh, retired police, uh, handler from uh, New York. Uh, and he cornered me and ragdolled me in their hotel room. Uh, these things are extremely frightening. I think, uh, Debbie, you're watching here. Um, you know, uh, I don't look for these threats to my life from other dogs or from dogs. I mean, I just do what I'm supposed to do. And um, that's why I always say every single dog, every dysfunctional dog, every reactive dog, every dangerous dog, every predatorial dog can be downtrained. And I've proven it consistently 100% across the board. Don't believe me, bring a dog to me. It's just so disheartening to see to see other trainers and behaviors and, and people who, who won't, who won't swallow their pride for the safety and the life of, of their client's dogs. They'll just keep taking money. Yo, you need another session. You need to go to an advanced aggressive dog group. I'm like advanced aggressive dog group. Huh? Who's calling, who's creating this? <laughs> the dog's aggressive. I get the dogs coming in. People are like, okay, here's the situation. Da, 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 da. Okay. I'm like, okay, does the dog bite? Okay. The dog bites or not. If he bites and I'm like, okay, well, just make sure you hold on to the dog tightly on the leash you know if the dog attacks other people what uh, i mean other other people or uh, uh, other dogs then let's make cautionary uh, uh, uh precautionary uh, uh efforts to ensure that things don't happen almost always the dog is unmuzzled and um you know that's what you're paying somebody for is to work with your dog and that's what you want them to do all right so i'm gonna get to this resource guarding thing um, and it's kind of related to what I'm talking about here as I uh, um, uh, desperately segue into it. Um, resource guarding when you're on the bed. Not you as per se, you resource guarding. You know, your boyfriend comes in, your husband comes in, and you're like, no, it's my bed. Uh, it's resource guarding when your, your dog is on the bed. Is it resource guarding or is it aggression? These are things to kind of look for in regards to figuring out dysfunctions. Uh, I'm going to kind of generally go over it. Once I get my computer, my new computer in the beginning of December, once I figure out how to use it, once I get the rest of my equipment and, and you know, I found out now I have to get an HDMI capture unit or device, and that's like 200 bucks. Uh, this camera I got, uh, the other one was only like 200 and something, which I thought was going to work, but it turns out it won't. Now this one is like, well, I almost spent a thousand dollars yesterday on it. Um, from the salesperson at, at the uh, Visions Electronics, and I gotta say, those those guys are don't shower. Holy cow, they don't shower at all. And I'm kind of like trying to be polite, listening to the guy. I'm like, oh wait a minute, I, mm. somebody needs some old spice or some extra, extra, extra old spice. But, uh, you know, it was nice. I mean, I got the camera and all stuff, so I got that. And I'm going to look at getting some light light boxes so I don't have so much shadowing and all that. Uh, a few things. And then, you know, hopefully I'll be able to um, um, live stream it, figure it out. And then I'll create a bit more of a podcasting um, structure on it. Yeah, you're right, Sammy. They don't want their ego bruised. Mary says, this is the difference. Uh, that's the difference between love and money. And Sammy says, you. Uh, <laughs> 
when you're on the bed, when you're on your bed and your dog is with you, uh, a lot of times people will, you know, if you have a dysfunctional dog, right? Just, just dysfunctional. That's it. Not, not a regular happy-go-lucky dog, right? Everything I talk about is about dysfunction. No dogs. Dogs that react, that bite people, that attack or whatever, right? Skittish dogs. You know, when you, you're laying there under the covers and your dog's on top of the, the covers, right? For those of you who let your dogs on the bed. And uh, for those of you who have had this happen, where you move your leg and your dog immediately goes to attack it, right? Your dog goes to attack your leg. And people are like, oh my gosh, freaked out, right? If it's a small dog, 10, 20, 50, maybe 100 pounds, a smaller dog, it's not scary. When you have a dog that's 150, 200 pounds on your bed, it's really quite frightening because then they stand up as well. And they're, and they're, they're, they're towering already because they're about three, about three, uh, three feet uh, just at the withers off the ground, off the top of the bed. So it's pretty scary. Why does a dog, why does our dog, why does your dog uh, react when you move your foot under the covers? Because they don't know what it is. It's that simple. They're scared of an unknown movement. It's kind of like a shock collar when you, when those people, those, those horrific trainers, uh, inexperienced trainers that use shock collars. And like I say, for a trainer, you shouldn't have to use a shock collar. For a private person, it's a different story because you're doing what you can and know only what to do. For a trainer, behaviors to use a shock collar, it's, it's inexperienced, it's crude, it's a uh, uh, Neanderthal. Uh, it's uh, what a troglodyte does, which is like a Neanderthal. Um, dog doesn't understand what that movement is underneath. They only see something move, and if they're really skittish or 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 aggressive they're going to see something moving and their first thought is going to be there's something down there that i'm not used to it scared me i don't know if it's going to attack me but i sure as heck better attack it first and most times they don't because they can't tell where the object is right they i talk about field of vision processing right it's through redundant redundant anticipatory formats so, and I'll get to that once I do my podcast. And then, I, like I said, I'll structure everything. And then you all can go, oh, you know what? Now we're actually learning instead of James going on and on. Um, that's the beauty of these live vlogs. Um, but your dog can't focus. Your dog can't create an, a, a targeting system on, on it. They don't know what's going on. And uh, other times when people are trying to get on the bed and their dog won't let them on the bed because they're already on it. And that's happened. Nero we used to do that to me. And I was living with somebody at the time. Neither of us could get on the bed all night. And, and, you know, I just got to the point where I just, I would make accommodations uh, because of Nero's uh, uh, history was so traumatic. He was caged for seven years for breeding and then chained up outside with a prong collar for three years after that in Alabama. And he's a great Dane that dragged a, a large adult off a couch and onto the floor, inflicting wounds requiring 67 stitches. Nero would jump on the bed and he wouldn't let me. And he, he wouldn't let my, my uh, the person I was living with, he wouldn't let her on the bed. He wouldn't let me on the bed, nothing. And so there's two, two, two ways of approaching it. You either leave the dog on the bed, which some people will call dominant aspects of it, which is like I say, dominance is such a misnomer. It's an incorrect term. Or else they will chase the dog off the bed, right? For me, it depends on what the dog's dysfunctions are. If they have low self-esteem, uh, low self-confidence, low self-worth, maybe somewhat uh, a low codependency ratio, I'll leave the dog on my bed and make accommodations to make adjustments as he assimilates my behavior around him day by day or night by night by night. We want to gauge what our dog is like. We want to gauge what your dog is like, your dysfunctional dog. You want to gauge what your dysfunctional dog is like. When you try to approach the, the bed, if they start growling, what kind of growl is it? Is it a vocalization of an engagement? Is it a vocalization of, uh, of guarding? Is it a, a warning? You want to interpret those things. Is it good to, to, to shoo off the dog off your bed so you can get on the bed? If it's necessary, then do it. Do so safely. Do so with some sort of uh, shield or uh, you know a large pillow that the dog can't target accurately because of the, 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 the large, uh, the, 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 the diffusion of the target uh, by the physical size of the target. You want to figure out what the dysfunctions are. If your dog is skittish and they're doing that growly a little bit, 
it's a it's a it's a, a, a dependency issue. It is uh, speaking to the dog's uh, self esteem. You want to gauge it, but how do you get back onto the bed? Slowly, <laughs> you get back on the bed slowly. Um, you want to figure out piece by piece, right? You know, if the dog is laying on your side of the bed, if you live alone, right? If the dog is laying on your side of the bed, then you want to kind of shoo him off onto the other side. You just want to shoo him off. The bed is, say the bed is right here and you get on the bed here. You just want to shoo the, and, and, and your dog is laying right here. You want to shoo your dog off to just over here. You don't want to shoo him right off the bed. I don't do that. I don't shoo my, uh, any of the dogs, even the, the dangerous ones. I don't shoo them off. The, I don't get them to go off the bed unless they've been really naughty and they've ripped the bed sheets or something like that. But I will, again, make them just go off a little bit so that they're still on the bed so that they learn to understand that my physical socialization with them, right, physical and social, right, my physical socialization with them is innocuous. That all I'm doing is just, hey, dude, just move over to my dog. I'm not trying to confront them. I'm not trying to make them scared. I'm not trying to intimidate them. I'm not being passive or submissive, which is, again, a misnomer. I'm just using these terms for everyone. I'm not trying to do anything to my dog that's going to make him feel that they're unwanted or that they're in trouble for doing something that they naturally think is all right. Your dog thinks laying on the bed is all right. They think laying on your side of the bed, which is a dependency issue, is all right. If they're guarding it, then just correct it. Use a use a shield. I used to I have to I used to use a shield with Walter. I mean, it was significant, some of the stuff that I had to do with, with Walter. Like, not a shield as per se, just I had to use a large metal contraption that folded up so I could hold it as a shield. And those were, those were tough things. Um, but you want to just shoo them off, just slightly off to the side. Because when you shoo them right off the bed, then you create a, not a necessarily a competitive perspective on their end, but you create a disenfranchisement of the family, of the familial pack, of that dependency, the codependency between you and your dog or your family and your dog, you, you create a disenfranchisement and your dog recognizes that. They recognize the tone of voice that we use, uh, how we are yelling or not yelling, how we are uh, creating urgency, how we're talking to them. They understand our conversational tone. They understand our physical movements. When I go to move near, when I was, would move near off the bed, I would not, I, I would take the, you know, if I had whatever I had, I would just basically push it into him. And of course, in the beginning, he would react and, and then attack it and, and, and not, and then try to attack me. But he eventually got to the point where I would just push him off onto his side of the, or whatever spot was left on the bed for him. I would just push him off. I didn't create a confrontational behavior with him because he wasn't being confrontational. Even though he would be barking, growling, and lunging at me on the bed. It was because his misunderstanding that the bed was shared between the two or three of us. Actually, Sammy was there, so there's four of us. But he didn't understand that the bed was a shared resource. He didn't understand that the bed was home for everybody. As Nero learned that everyone sleeps there at night and that no one's out there to threaten them and that he's not going to get in trouble, it got easier and easier and easier. And then Nero, out of his dysfunctions, he would end up sleeping towards the foot of the bed, head down, right? And I and I have a um. I have a a questionnaire, a detailed behavioral analysis questionnaire that I wrote up, um, that's got over a hundred questions with multiple choice, and every single question has a reason, and every answer, and some of these multiple choice answers are like 15, 20 answers and multiple choice answers in deep. They all are relevant to the behavior of the dog, and it gives me an, uh, a, a quite a striking um, uh, reflection of the dog's personality and dysfunctions based on the information provided by the humans. And it'll take them like an hour and a half, two hours to fill out. And I got uh, right now it's kind of down. I got to get it fixed here. Um, but it allows me to understand the dysfunctions, right? And that's what we want to do with with our dog on the bed. Why are they on the bed? Why are they re, why are they guarding it? What are they doing? How do we get him off the bed so that he's not going to, uh, not the, so that he's not going to attack anyone? Um, so, so yeah. So you just want to remember that 
um, is how you're going to approach the dog, your dog when they're trying to guard the bed. Uh, regardless, get a device. Be safe. Be very, very safe. If you think that there's any possibility of personal injury or injury to somebody else or any type of destructive behavior that may arise out of your your approach to your dog or uh, someone else's dysfunctional dog or dog, do not, and this is the disclaimer, do not attempt it. Do not risk your personal safety. Do not risk someone else's safety. End of the day, something happens not only will you get hurt, the dog gets killed almost always, just like it was with this other dog uh, uh, the other day. You just want to let your dog know that he's not in trouble. Right? If, if, if Zevia's on the bed and Zevia's prancing around and won't let me on the bed and she thinks it's funny and she'll bark at me when I try to get to the bed, I realize that that's her joking around. But if I try to get on the bed and Zevia becomes aggressive in her mannerisms, because there's a difference in the way that the dog's physicality is somewhat uh, light in cadence, in movement, right, to a dog that is reactive or being aggressive because it's a bit more directional, it's a bit more pronounced. And you can see that in the difference. And you can hear it in the tone of voice uh, that the dog, with the sounds that they're making, their, their vocalization, their growls, their barks, you can hear the tone, right? And those of you who have dogs for a long time, you can tell the sound of your dog's whining and the sound of your dog's barking. You all know to start listening to if a, your dog is uh, reactive, uh, aggressive. Don't be afraid, just listen. And then you start to hear more so. Um, and then the other thing that happened to Sean uh, with Buddy is that uh, she, she she started, you know, doing split shift work, um, um, was taking him to this daycare and, and no more because it, it's, uh, I, I, I it didn't seem like it was conducive for him. Um, she got up, I think like four o'clock in the morning and went to the, to the bathroom or somewhere and getting ready for work. Actually, oh, you should get, yes, she went to the bathroom getting ready for work. She works like at four o'clock in the morning. Wow. I was like, Ooh, holy cow. Um, and so she, she went to the bathroom, came back, uh, to the bedroom and on the bed and, um, you know, she got on the bed with him and he was being aggressive and he nipped her in the face, actually. He, he, he bit her in the face. Um, so it's, a, it's a bit of a scarring, not scarring. It, it, I don't know if there's any blood drawn, but there's a few, there's a, you can see the teeth marks actually. And so she's really lucky in that part of it. But, um, you know, so what I explained to, to Sean is, uh, is that she needs to go back to not step one, but step two and step three and to stop having conversations with, uh, with her dog as was before and just kind of get back to the tough love situation where then buddy then feels a bit more supervised, a bit more uh, delineated in his uh, position, uh, his placement in the home. It wasn't getting muddied over. It wasn't getting cloudied over. It wasn't getting, you know, conflated it. He, he will then start to learn where he's at. And then he was uh, exhibiting other types of behavior where he would be um, somewhat, uh, uh, he would nip her when, when, when Sean would move, uh, some furniture or just to kind of move a, a, a table or, you know, just for whatever reason, uh, but he would go start nipping her and, 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 and yanking on her clothing and all that stuff. Right. And so these are aspects of change. These are things that he's not sure of. He doesn't understand what's going on and those type of situations, depending on what specifics are. Um, but generally speaking for you guys, it's just more a point of, addressing for buddy addressing for your dog if you're going to do something get back into the bed whatever you want to address your dog you want to make eye contact with them in a very friendly parental way hi buddy hi silly boy you want to correct him you want to watch him as well so that way he doesn't feel like that because if you've gone to the bathroom you've gone somewhere and you've gone for an hour or 10 minutes or five minutes you come back your dog has already processed his own thoughts the ideations in his head that are going through are going to be relevant to you when you come back into the room. And maybe he's thinking of something else. Maybe he feels nervous or scared, right? Your dog might be any of these things. Acknowledge your dog before you step into the bed. Make sure you bring something that's going to be uh, safety. If you feel that there's an urgency uh, of, uh, to your personal safety, have something there. 
shoo him off. If he's gone onto your, your pillow or if he's gone onto your side of the bed, shoo him off. But just off to his side or, or you know, just shoo him off a little bit over to the side. But don't kick him off the bed. If, if he's a real jerk about it, then you can kick him off the bed. If Nero was a real jerk and he's, he was like that, I would literally kick him off the bed. Well, not literally. But I, would, I would take my shield and I would just shove him right off the bed. And then I would, right? I'd shove him off the bed. I'd shove Nero off the bed. And then five seconds later, Nero would just jump back. I'd be in the bed and, 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 uh, um, and then Nero would just jump back on the bed again. And he's like, hey, how's it going? But then the cool thing was he understood he didn't get in trouble. He understood that he was getting pushed off because this is where I sleep and this is where I'm going to take this, my position on the bed, right? There's, some of us live up, like to sleep on the left side. Some like to sleep on the right side. Some like to sleep in the middle. So he then understood where he was allowed to sleep. And then he understood contentment and trust and inclusion. He understood he belonged and he was respected. Even when he was being a jerk, push him off, off the bed. If I had to be forceful, I'd be forceful. And then again, I would get back on the bed, in the bed, under the blankets, let him back onto the bed. Um, yeah, it was kind of just, just anyways, you, you, you just want to watch that out when it comes to resource guarding. Um, the bed is, is not necessarily don't take no for an answer, but not exert, uh, assert yourself and not be dominant. Just essentially just show your dog that it's not cool what they did. And though you may be afraid and scared inside and your heart's beating, you're going to have to fake it. And be safe, of course. Don't take unnecessary risks. And just push your dog off to his side or their side of the bed, wherever they should be. Or just basically push them off your side of the bed. They can go wherever they want. And they'll figure out where they want. And then you're in the bed. When you're moving your feet, your dog doesn't know what to target. So your dog is thinking, what the heck is this thing coming at me? It suddenly moved when nothing moved at all, right? You know how that, that optical illusion where you're just like, did you see that? I swear that statue moved that kind of behavior, your dog is doing the same thing. But because your dog is in a defensive measure instinctively, what are they going to do? They got to protect themselves. They don't know what's going on. Uh, I will always say to Nero uh, when that would happen or, or actually pretty well, oh, almost every dog that I've had has been like that. Well, not all, almost all. Some, some have, some haven't. Um, but um, I will always say their name too. And a lot of things, like I said to Sean is what I do is before, I start to move around. I will say my dog's name or the dog's name uh, who's laying closest to my body part that I'm going to move. So if I'm at, if Nero's at the foot of the bed, which is where he would always sleep and I would move my foot. And in the beginning, like I say, he, he didn't like it uh, having it moved. I would say Nero, Nero. And I'd move my foot a little bit, right? You know how you test and you, you, tr you let them assimilate to, to these sudden unknown movements. I would always let Nero know that it was me that was moving so that he could hear and, and connect movement by, my, by the blanket by my leg with me telling him that was me. So then he started to learn more and more and more. And then every once in a while, once I got braver, I would stick my foot out from underneath the blanket so he could see it was my foot. And then he would just look at my foot like, oh, does your, he look at me like, does your foot know there's something dangerous under the blanket with it? <laughs> he would just be looking at my foot like, that was underneath with that dangerous monster thing that I was trying to attack? They, they understand. Our dog's absolutely brilliant, right? So, so they understand. Um, let's see, what did I put down on the notes here? Familiarity with being on a bed, yeah. So some dogs aren't going to be comfortable with being on a bed because they're not used to it. Dogs that have lived on, on, on concrete, on gravel, and so forth like that are not going to be used to a soft bed. And you'll see sometimes where they lay on a, you know, on a doggy bed, and then other times they'll just lay on the, on the floor. And you're like, well, that can't be comfortable. But it, it's somewhat of a comfort aspect of it, a latent comfort part. Minky, 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 Minky. Minky is, uh, he's right down here. He's, ooh, sorry, he's right down here and he's licking himself and it's a little distracting because I'm, the sound is really uh, uh, not, not attractive. Uh, okay, understanding your dog does not understand what's moving underneath. So I, got, I went over that. Resource guarding or aggression. So understanding the difference. Understanding the behavior of your dog, whether or not they're being aggressive, whether or not the tone of their voice is being aggressive. 
And uh, I talk about voice key, that unique key, that unique tone that our dogs will be uh, 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 listening for that they themselves find comfort in, that they themselves are more likely to listen to because there's some sort of inherent uh, familiarity for them. And that's going to be through their, your, their, your dog's association with you in the home. Uh, how to address your dog on the back. Okay, talk about that. Uh, I, it's going to be, there's more in-depth stuff, like I say, but, it, you know, this is a live blog. Uh, where your dog sleeps on your bed is important. That is as well. Your dog sleeps at the top of the bed by your head or your dog sleeps down by the foot of the bed. Uh, which way is your dog facing? If they're, if they're laying at the foot of the bed, are they facing you? Or are they facing uh, towards the foot of the bed? Are they facing themselves in a perspective where they can see the door, the window? All these things have uh, relevance to it. Um, all of it has relevance. It's, it all speaks to the dysfunction of, the, of your dog. It speaks to your dog's uh, understanding of their place in your family. Minky is going to town. Like Minky is going to town right now on 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 everything down there. Uh, he's like actually holding his breath, and he's like, <laughs> so. Uh, Minky, come on. Hi, silly boy. Hi, Minky. Hi, Minky. I'll invite Minky up here. Come, Minky, up. Hi, silly boy. Minky, hello. Minky, hi, silly boy. M Minky, okay, watch over Sammy. Hi, Minky. This is Minky. Hi, silly boy. Hi, silly boy. Couldn't even touch Minky. Um, couldn't even touch Minky. In the, in the, uh, well, you see the video of the th first 36 hours that I have. I'll put the link up there. Couldn't even touch Minky. Um, at all, right? Because he was born and raised on a meat dog farm. And Sammy's glaring at me now. Hi, silly boy. Do you can see the eyes of Minky? You see that that part of that? Uh, let me just see if we can see that part. These aspects, see how his eyes are positioned and, and the way they turn and they drop down and how they don't blink. And they only blink selectively at, at certain key points. Th those are all indicators of an emotional context. Let me just bring uh, Emotional and cognitive context. This is Sammy. Sammy wants you to say hi. Sammy, Sammy saw. Sammy knows now when I'm here that she gets to go on. Sammy, say something. Okay. Sammy's really shy. She's from Taiwan. You know how those dogs are, are shy in Taiwan. Uh, what, uh, Sammy, uh, Sammy uh, Bertani. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, Sammy, Sammy. Um, weren't you ever afraid they might bite you in the middle of the night? 100%, Sammy. And, and Nero did that in the middle of the night. And uh, the, the person I was living with, she was gone to work already. Uh, she, she worked a super early shift. And uh, so it was just me and Nero. And Nero, uh, Nero had, uh, was laying with his back to me with his head to the, uh, to the end of the, the bed. And his hips, I mean, uh, his, his bum was at my hips, right? For a Great Dane, that's the normal size. And he, you know, he was facing down towards the door, right? So I talk about these things. Other dogs face different directions, and it's a, it's a different reason. But... Um, so I purposely triggered Nero and it's pitch black. It was pitch black. And I tr purposely triggered Nero by touching him in a certain way that I knew would trigger him. And he immediately got up without moving his back end. And he basically curled up like an, like an <laughs> anaconda or, or a velociraptor. And he just curled up without moving his back end. And he, he, go, he goes, Rrr! and as he goes, Rrr! he went, and that's when he got me by the top of the head. And it's the weirdest feeling to have a dog aggressively engulf your entire head, well, half your head, and feel the teeth on, on both sides. Um, like, I was super shocked. I was super, super scared. And um, I had to fake it and just go, Nero, not funny, right? <laughs> and uh, um, yeah, it's pretty scary. But yeah, and other times too. There were times where I thought uh, there were times where I thought I might be attacked during the night. Uh, when Walter first came, uh, I would tether him on a twenty-foot line to something that was very solid inside this other house I was living in that I was renting, and then uh, I would let uh, find out where the 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 leash the 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 the, the tether line would be at, and so if it was here then I would put my bed right there beside him at that edge, right close to him. And uh, those, were, those were a little bit tough. Even though he was on tether, it was, it was still pretty tough sometimes. It, there was a point where um, with, with Walter, I would put uh, around my 
I'm around my bed, I would put partitions up. Uh, I would use an X pen, which is an eight sided uh, pen. When you fold it flat, it becomes four sides that articulate that well, four piece panel, basically when you, you know, when you fold it in half. And then I would use that around my bed to make sure that he couldn't get at me. And then I would, I would put like vacuum cleaner and, and a suitcase and everything because I wanted to make sure that he can get to me. Uh, and that would go on for several weeks. Um, well, a, a couple of months and I would, um, leave the lights on because he was partially blind and deaf, partially deaf. So I'd leave the lights on and I changed all the lights to led lights. So I had a, a broader uh, light spectrum. And so he could see, so I'd be, you know, be sleeping in bright daylight <laughs> uh, just so he felt safe. And um, then he knew that we lived in the, in the bedroom and I would close the door because often in the beginning he would just leave and go to the living room. And like it was with Minky and all the other dogs, I bring them into my bedroom. So then he's there. He would never sleep on the bed because he recognized that Nero was on the bed and that Sammy was on the bed. And so he would do that when I wasn't, when, when they weren't on the bed, Walter would be on the bed. He, he ruined like a, a bed sheet, uh, a bed sheet thing, a set that was like over a hundred dollars one time. And I was like, Arr! I was so choked, but um, you know, those little things mean a lot. <laughs> um, so yeah. Okay. What does Sammy say? Yeah. Years ago, a vet here took in a big male Great Dane and woke up in the middle of the night with him standing over her growling. Luckily, the phone was near and she called for help. So what happened, though, if he's standing over her? I mean, I've, one time with, uh, with Walter, I didn't gauge how, how, how much the line was after I tethered him. I kind of just assumed. And then I reached it out and I went, oh, that's cool. But what I didn't realize is that I didn't secure it tight enough around the, the post itself. And it, it, it kind of got loose and added on two extra feet. So I woke up with him uh, beside me. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's cool. And we're like a living on, this, on the living room floor. And then he got, uh, Walter got up and I'm like, oh, that's kind of cool. And then he walked over me and he's, and I'm like, holy cow. Uh, and that was really scary. And I, I, I'll tell you, I really had to uh, take a deep breath. Hi, Sue. Uh, oh, he's standing over her growling aggressively. Yeah, that's, that's scary. I mean, yeah, I've been there. I've been there. Um, so uh, let's just see. So, uh, yeah. So where your dog sleeps on the bed is important and it indicates personality and reflects dysfunctions, right? So I always talk about, again, which way is the dog, your dog facing on the bed? How are they? Do they sleep? Uh, full out, they're like, you know, all four legs out and their body straight, or do they sleep up curled? How do they sleep on their stomachs? That type of uh, behavior all indicates what type of dysfunctions, right? We all have personal preferences on how we, sorry, Sammy, we all have personal preferences in how we sleep, right? Left side, right side on our back, on the front uh, and all that. Um, so it all makes sense because uh, it's all indicative of a, of a personality traits. We think that humans don't, we think humans have personality traits, which we do. And we have behaviors that are, are somewhat common amongst people who have similarities of personality and energy and intellectual uh, uh, context. Uh, dogs do too as well. I mean, I think they, someone told me there's eight temp, uh, personality templates in humans. So this is ergo going to be, there's going to be personality traits in dogs because of the psychological uh, uh, processing that they have are you okay sam hi sammy sammy's so cute sammy's like a little baby sammy's a little baby she's so happy uh so so yeah um if you have any questions i'm gonna finish this off if you guys have any questions feel free to uh ask it was a little bit of a kind of a informal emotional kind of uh vlog tonight just because of um i had to talk about this dog that was um unnecessarily killed I, but you know i guess in all fairness, for me, because I can, I feel, right, I believe because I can, I believe that every single dog can be, every dysfunctional, every dangerous, skittish, whatever dog can be downtrained. I believe that because I do it. Uh, but I do have to recognize that there are people out there, uh, trainers, behaviors that can't do what I'm doing. And I do understand that and I appreciate it. I think more than anything else is the, humility and the modesty and the service to uh, your, uh, your client's dogs 
to say, I don't know what to do or, or, you know, need to find somebody else or whatever, but I don't think your dog is that bad. Um, because what ends up happening is people misinterpret the information that's provided to them uh, by esteemed professionals. And then they go and they kill the dog. Like I said, Dr. Rebecca Ledger, uh, who writes the Vancouver Sun column and, you know, is consults with uh, Vancouver Animal Control and Surrey Animal Control and all these other places and consults with the governmental agencies on you know, all levels, you know, from, from regional to, to state and provincial and federal. And she recommends dogs to be killed. And I'm like, really? That dog's easy. That dog's, that dog's a walk in the park for me. But you know what? When you're at the top of the food chain, you don't care. Like, you don't care about the dogs because to you, to those people, they are, they, they see our dogs that are reactive or, or whatever as throwaway. If they didn't, then they, then the, the academia, the, the industry, the dog training industry, the dog training, the dog psychology industry, if they truly cared, they would find alternative methods to address dogs that they claim this disgusting term behavioral euthanasia. So, um, you know, the industry uh, is, is sucks. Would Walter ever regress to his previous behaviors if he was with someone else? You know, that's a good question, Sammy, because it's all dependent on the human and the understanding. Uh, you know, when I get dogs, hi, Sammy. Oh, Sammy. When I get dogs that come to me, my criteria criteria are, are, are quite uh, quite simple. Have they attacked people? Six to nine people. Have they are they vicious? Do they have resource I mean, resource guarding? Male aggression, uh, dog aggression. Those are just normal things that happen in every dog at, at that level, um, and more submerged uh, uh, issues. So I I read the way each dog is. So with Walter, it was really specific. Like I said, I thought it was seven to 12 to 14 months for rehab. Then I revised it after finding I was partially blind and partially deaf and other issues as well. That surface that was never told to me. Uh, then I said 12 to 19 months. So I, I make the adjustments to the dog. I follow the dog's psychological behavior because how else am I going to help any dog Walter, Nero, Sammy, Minky, how am I going to help any dog if I don't understand their psychological issues? I don't want people to think that it's impossible for yourselves to do it. I have clients who hire me and I teach them and I give them free support uh, for the lifetime of their dog because I believe that that's ethically and, and morally sound. Um, and we just work towards guiding, I work towards guiding them uh, to to trust your intuition, to follow the stuff that's inside of you that you inherently know that if you trusted yourself makes sense versus the stuff of trying to give a dog treats when they're angry, right? Like I said, try, try giving a, you know, try giving your spouse, you know, you guys are having an argument, try giving your spouse, you know, uh, candy when you're having a fight. They're gonna they're gonna slap it away and they're gonna yell at you and call you crazy and get even more incensed and more angry at you for for disrespecting them. Uh, so um, it's all dependent on the dog, it really is, and it's dependent on the humans to have accommodations. That's why in a rescue situation, a rescue org situation, we try to match the human to the dog and the dog to the human. So it's not just one-sided. It's not just, hey, let's get rid of this dog because now we can get another one, right? Some rescues do that. Some are, some are really bad. But it's the point of, hey, let's find out what the issues are on both sides, right? What does, is this human able to accommodate or this human family able to accommodate their dog, this, this rescue, and is rescue able to accommodate the other dog based on the energy of uh, other humans based on the energy of the dog, right? Uh, and the cells. I've known, uh, Sammy says, I've noticed dogs some, sometimes behave differently with different people. Yes, absolutely, 100%. Dogs behave differently with different people. Uh, like I said, right, they make adaptations to their environment, to their social or familial environment. And it's, and I've said this before too, is 
if you're a manager and you have 10 staff and all 10 are right, you can have 10 staff underneath you. They're not the same, right? You got 10 different personalities, ages and, 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 and all that stuff, right? All these different variants, 10 different people. How do you manage them? You have to figure out which one to do this, which one's that. Oh, five out of uh, four out of five of my dogs here are all dog reactive, and they're all resource. Well, and the three out of five, the Danes, are all resource guarding. Uh, and yeah, so they're um, they're pretty pretty uh, vicious. They're pretty vicious, and and there's been a lot of tense times that, that have happened. But I work with the dogs to get them to adapt to the home. So that even when they do fight, like a couple of siblings fighting, kids fighting, when the dogs do fight, I address it and then I stop and I watch them. And they know I'm watching them. And then go, oh, 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 okay. You know, there was, uh, there was times where uh, Walter would attack Nero. Once he learned that he could take Nero out because he outweighed Nero by 40 to 50 pounds, and by seven and almost eight inches of height. Um, uh, when Walter learned that he could, just through play, and just like what Anthony does to, to William, he could just knock Nero over. And, um, and then he realized, oh, okay. And then he started becoming somewhat a bit more uh, pronounced in his, uh, his, in his uh, negative behavior. And, um, you know, I had to make sure that I could create an accommodation so that Nero felt safe and that Walter felt safe, that, right, yes, believe it or not, and that they both felt that there was a cohesiveness and a, parent, a parenting uh, aspect for me, a supervision. Not an alpha male, not an alpha uh, or dominant situation, right? Like I say, it's a misnomer. I parented them so that they got along. And it took a few weeks for that to happen. They were still attacked with each other. And Amy at Save Rocky, where uh, Nero came from and, and, and she knew about Walter. She knew what was happening and I would have conversations with her about it. So she knew that, you know, there's some, like, you know, Sammy, since you have Dane, right? You, you know, when they fight, they move furniture. As I've said before, they're, they're moving couches that weigh, you know, 150 pounds on the ground. They're stuck on the carpet and they're just shoving them away without anything as they're, as they're attacking each other. So, um, and then the other thing is about dogs behaving differently with people is also, you got to realize too, if we start a new job somewhere, and I've talked about this before too, right? If we start a new job somewhere, we're going to figure out that it's good for us to kind of be on our, on our, uh, behavior, you know, to observe evaluative behavior, to observe how the rest of the, the, the office is working, right? The rest of the team is working. We look to see who we want to hang out with. Who we, uh, who are the leaders in the group, uh, in the office, uh, right? We make accommodations. Same thing as well as. Uh, same thing as well um, is is. Um, you know how you have people, friends that are all different walks of life, right? There's always people like, yeah, I've got friends like this, and I got friends like that, and I got friends like this, and I and friends like that, and and you know my friend, right? We are different with each of our different friends. It's not like we're a standard, which we are, but we, we hang out with this one friend who's hyperactive. We're like, totally cool, man. Okay, let's do something crazy, right? And then we have friends who, uh, you know, want to watch a play. Okay, hey, this is there. Let's see that. And we start talking artistic and organic and intellectually and, 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 revi uh, and reviewing what we saw in the play. We, we, we make a adaptations to our own environments dogs are going to do so and it's darwin it's evolution it's predation it's that part of it uh sue says how do you separate them uh i, I talked about that before where how to separate uh, the the danes the great danes um if i can't pull them off by the collar and i will and, and i mean i've got quite a bit of strength so i can i can literally Pull uh, 150, 180 pound Great Dane back, um, but if they've got a, a, a very strong bite grip on the other Dane or other dog, then I will try to pound them in the face, right, and the jawline to separate them. 
from that. And if that doesn't help, then I will, uh, and, and other times too, I'll just uh, use a blunt force uh, stomp, right? A kick. And I talk about that in that other thing on how to exercise that. I'll put that link in the, in the description here. I will use a stomp on their back end, especially if they have a very tight grip, a bite grip on, on the other target, on the other dog. Because if I go towards the front of their head or their chest with so much force from my leg, from my quads, right? If I go with so much force and they're already holding on, that can literally cause them to rip the skin of the other dog. And when it comes to a Great Dane, it's a much different premise versus a dog that has, you know, like a 50 pound dog has a 20 pound dog in their mouth. It's a, it's a different premise uh, to, to address. Uh, but the bigger guys, that's what I'll do is I'll stomp in the back end. So it offsets their balance and, and all that. And I'll, and I'll call out their name in a very measured manner as well. And, and it's really, uh, there's a lot of adrenaline rush that's going through. You just freaked out and, uh, but that's what I'll do anyways. So that's how I separate them. Um, yeah, it is. Uh, it's extremely scary. Uh, Sue, uh, you know, uh, Debbie, uh, Deb, uh, Michael Martin, right. Debbie Martin, uh, Debbie's seen it. Debbie's seen things that have happened and I, I'm right there in the middle. And it is scary. Uh, and I'm always afraid of getting them to turn on me and attack me as well because they think I'm going after them as well. So it can be scary. Sammy, I've only had Yorkies that would fight. I would put the, uh, I would pick them up and run their face under the water. You know, um, don't have to do it to that point. Just separate them. And um, you can put them in, in separate areas if you separate them in separate rooms or whatever and to do so and then it allows them to learn the process what's going on and then being vigilant the next time and next time and next time and they're like oh okay gosh i'm gonna get in trouble again um it's just that part right because because unless they go to an extreme situation unless they're tearing apart the throat of another dog or uh, about to cause uh, critical or fatal injuries i i try to just give one level up in regards to uh, uh, separating them physically, um, they would they would they would lick together, they would lock together. Oh yeah, they would lock together. You know, you can grab them by, like I said about the Yorkies, you can grab them. Oh, sorry, Sammy, grab them by the back of the jaw, right at the hinge point to to do that. And I know it's sometimes hard for women uh, or people with small hands to do with any size dog. You want to just grip through and and, and pinch it through like you would do to a human. Um, there's other parts of it, flat pounding on the head or, or on the side of the fist as well. You don't want to hit them with the knuckles because uh, it, it incites pain even more. So uh, I always try to use as much mass, blunt force mass on the dog to separate them. I, I, the only times I'll give them a nudge or a poke is if they're not paying attention. And I, hey, stop it, right? And then they're like, oh, okay. And then after that, then they know. And they also know that when I do separate them, I'll get pissed off at them in, in really loud, angry tone of voice. Like, you know, uh, I don't yell because now I'm going to get everyone upset here. And so I'll, I'll use it in a, in a loud, somewhat angry voice and tell them to stop it. And then I'll separate them and then I'll watch. And then if one dog goes back towards the other, which has happened, then I will step right in and I'll call out that dog's name and I'll step right in and say, stop it. And then the dog that's about to be attacked feels that I have the family structure under supervision. So it's, uh, it's kind of like all, all part of it. Um, luckily the three I have now don't fight the two docile. I want another Yorkie. Uh, yeah, you're welcome, Sue. You know, I, 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 I can't handle docile dogs in the sense that, I, 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 like, I'm afraid. I'm deathly afraid. Like, I'm not just afraid. I'm deathly afraid. It's like, I've said before, it's like being in the wild while being stalked by a wolf or a bear. It's that feeling. And I, you know, I've gone hiking and mountaineering and it's really scary because you're like, I know something's there and you know something's there. This is a bit different because they're right there in front of me. And the fear of them turning on me is high. Uh, the fear of what they can do is quite high. It's not that thrill that I'm looking for. It's just, uh, you know, I'm better suited 
with uh, the higher end dysfunction. And by working with a higher end dysfunction, no dogs, then I'm able to um, show the world again, you know, continuously. This is how, e how straightforward, I shouldn't say easy because it's easy for me, right? Uh, it's straightforward to address uh, their issues. Um, yeah, it is uh, terrifying, Sue. Like I say, it, it is. I mean, there's been times where I don't know that if I got attacked, would I be able to phone 911 in time or would I bleed out? And other fears of mine were if I was to uh, be injured, uh, would I be able to even dial 911 because would there be too much blood? And these are literal visions that I have in situations where I'm confronted uh, with uh, some of these things. Uh, and, and Debbie says, uh, very true, James, about the parental control, Debbie. Yeah. Um, it just, it's just scary. That's all. Uh, that's all I'm saying. Is it's just, it's really scary. It's terrifying. I got a couple of videos that I should put up. Once I get my podcast going, I got a couple of videos. One is where Nero uh, um, had, had attempted to attack me at about six o'clock in the morning, um, a week after he arrived. Or no, sorry, three weeks after he arrived. He tried attacking me, and then I, he was on the couch, uh, my couch, uh, uh, the other place, and uh, I sat down while he's growling, uh, standing over me, and that was pretty scary. Um, just lots of stuff have happened, but whatever, who cares? You know, getting, yeah, who cares? Um, all right, so I'm going to let everyone go. Uh, I want to thank everyone. I'm going to put Sammy down. Everyone say bye to Sammy. Sammy? 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 Sammy's so funny. Sammy knows she's going down. Okay, go, go, Sammy. There you go, Sammy. Okay, so thank you, everybody. Today, uh, I will go back on, on Friday, I think. Yeah, Friday will be the next one. I'll be doing that. Uh, yes, Sammy, dogs are not just cunning. They're predatorial in their behavior. And being predatorial means that they have the analytical ability to ascertain their threat in their environment and what steps, what uh, what uh, uh, avenues of self-preservation that they can uh, apply and um, it's kind of a uh, it's fascinating it's it's really really fascinating it's really fascinating all right everybody thank you so much I want uh, I want to say thank you again for everyone who's been following me if you found uh, my vlog here uh, entertaining enjoyable please share my work please uh, like and uh, click subscribe on my YouTube channel to follow me. I'm at 494 subscribers now, so I'm getting like one or two a, a, a week. Uh, thank you as well, Sue. You're so awesome, Sue. I hope Momo and everyone's doing well. Um, uh, yeah, so if you if you enjoyed what it is, that's great. Uh, eventually, when all my equipment shows up, then I will be doing podcasts, and it's going to look a lot better than this fuzziness that you see. And I just realized that it's actually not a – my computer's – really old like like nine ten years old eight nine ten years old uh, ex-girlfriend gave to, one of the, my ex-girlfriends gave to me um and uh, uh i didn't realize it doesn't have an actual focus it's kind of yeah it's kind of weird so i'm fuzzy everywhere and i just realized that for the last whatever vlogs i've been standing this close and my face is all fuzzy and i would watch the video and i would go why 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 am i so pixelated and, and grainy now i understand because i'm out of focus Look at that, hey? An Asian guy that doesn't know how to use a camera properly. <laughs> so, all right, guys. Everyone, enjoy yourselves. Thank you so much. And uh, have an awesome, incredible uh, evening. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to send me a, a text message. Make a comment in the uh, below, uh, any of your thoughts, all that cool stuff. And Minky is gone back to – oh, no, he stopped looking himself. Yay. All right, take care, everybody. Goodbye.